It is Tuesday. <laughs> that was fun. That was yes. Learn to sing out in any key. Any key. Um. So today we had what was definitely one of my most vulnerable episodes yet. We had Ashley Margison on to talk about miscarriages, which is something that I had over the summertime. Um, and what I noticed was just that there was like no good information anywhere. Um, so you're dealing with the emotional side and you're dealing with, you know, all of this other stuff, but you also don't have good info to know what's going on with your body and you have no parameter to see if something's normal, abnormal, like it mm. was just like you're kind of floating in the ether. And so what I kept thinking was like, God, I wish I had Ashley Marches in here to talk to. And then I realized we have this incredible podcast. And if I haven't had people talking to me about miscarriages, other people haven't been talking about miscarriages, which means we should probably should bring on Ashley to talk about miscarriages and what's going on with your hormones because she's so epic at yeah. everything hormones and she gets into the nitty-gritty and it was just so enlightening mm -hmm. I learned so much how about you, how did you yeah feel? I would I would say one I'm very proud of you for you know we we do say we share from the scar not from the wound so we checked in a lot before this I want everyone I yeah. know everyone will be like Raquel are you okay because uh, <laughs> you're a wonderful caring people um so I just want to say that and also that you know whatever place you're coming from when you listen to this episode if it's a partner if it's you know yourself or you know whatever your experience is is entirely valid and please take this we we wanted to aim to be very scientific about this um because we wanted to help people understand and for me it was very important for me to understand if i want to have children at some point what could happen because mm -hmm. there are a lot of things that i had to learn through raquel who unfortunately had to learn through trial and error so we uh I think that, yeah, very proud of you for doing this. We did it at a very good time. Raquel is healthy. I'm very happy to say, um, and as, uh, as hilarious as ever and laughing at everything. Uh, and, uh, Dr. Ashley Murchison is someone who really, really understands the importance of building a healthcare team. Uh, so, you know, please be conscious when you are listening to this episode, um, be conscious of how you share this information with other people, uh, because I do want to really drive home that this is a very individual experience. And what we wanted to do was to bring some light to it with some kindness and also from a very personal perspective. And I think Raquel has done an amazing job of that. And, oh. uh, and I would encourage you to watch it on YouTube, um, watch it wherever it shows up, which uh, is going to be in a another very cool place and maybe some more. Uh, so make sure that you're liking and subscribing in multiple places. But I think it's a, it's an incredibly important conversation that, uh, that we need to be normalizing having more of. Yes, all the yes, enjoy. Enjoy. Hello, Ashley. Welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me back. <laughs> oh my gosh. So I am going to give some background. We had Ashley on the podcast before and you definitely need to listen to that. Do you know the episode number, Christina? No, I don't no. know it off the top of my head. I can find Anyways, it. Anyways, it was on biohacking your hormones. It was an incredible episode. You definitely need to listen to it. Um, and I personally asked Ashley back because... Earlier this summer, I had a miscarriage, and one of the biggest things that I noticed was the lack of information surrounding it. So it's an awful thing to go through. It's emotional and it sucks, but more than anything, I think it was like really isolating because I just had no good info. Idea. Right? I had no idea. And my boyfriend was like, well, I, you know, I want to support you and help you. Like, is this normal? And I was like, I... I don't know if this is normal. <laughs> I have no idea because nobody talks about it. Like you get your period when you're a kid, everyone's already talked about it. So you're like, okay, this is what to expect, blah, blah, blah. You know, people get pregnant and they're like, okay, they all talk about it. That's something they know to expect. With miscarriages or abortions, nobody 
talks about it. And the crazy thing is, in Canada, they're estimating one in four pregnancies are ending in miscarriage. So why mm-hmm. the heck are we not I mean, talking I I about why, it? Right? Like, come on. And it's just so crazy what it's doing to your body. So I was like, mm. all I could think about when I was trying to sift through all of this garbage on the internet and like super generic, the good articles were just very generic. Mm. I was like, I just want Ashley Margeson. <laughs> I want a doctor. <laughs> like, I just need Dr. Ashley to come and tell me what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> literally I was like why am I getting acne everywhere why does everything suck and why do I cry all the time <laughs> Ashley <laughs> yep yep and oh just, my God. I just want to be clear for a second here we uh there are a lot of people and I'm going to preface this whole episode by saying what I love so much about Raquel is also the thing that makes her so different to a lot of people so it happened and uh and you know we have a promise to each other we'll always share from our scar and not from our wounds so I want you to all feel like safe in the knowledge that you know Raquel is healthy and doing the things that are good for her and she has a good support system myself included um and uh and and is not the same at processing emotions as many other people so i got a message and was like and she was like by the way this happened uh give me 24 hours and then i'll be fine and i was like "Ah, that doesn't sound i mean it sounds like raquel but it doesn't sound right so i want i want to and the reality is it was all right because it is Raquel. Um, and so I just want to say if there are emotions or things that are coming up, anyone who's experienced anything, please understand that we are talking um, from a place of love and respect for everyone's bodies being totally different. Um, for anyone who has a, you know, a, a female experience um, who identifies in different ways, this is for every single person who is been around or been involved in something like this that has happened. So I just wanted to create that little safe space. And I know that that is a thing, but I also am very aware that I'm going to be asking Raquel questions because Raquel seems to like steamroll over her emotions until (laughs) the end of the emotions. And then we come back and she was like, yeah, I was really ruined. Like that was awful. And I was like, didn't know nothing. All I this was like you just giggling and laughing and being like, oh, life is hell. And I was like, that's not <laughs> an appropriate reaction. It's like Joker. You're like a little bit like Joker. Right. It's interesting. Like, right. Oh. right? Like, the, the like smiles like, Ugh. <laughs> And like, I think, I think, well, from what I know about Raquel anyway, and what we've talked about is I think you process your emotions outside of yourself mm. as opposed to like Christina probably processes her emotions within herself. And yeah. so mm-hmm. both are valid. Right. Like it's just, if you're used to processing your emotions inside and somebody else is processing them externally, Mm -hmm. it's like really weird. And vice versa. (laughs) Yeah. All the, all along the spectrum, Raquel and I, that we just have moments where I'm like, oh, that's happening now. Oh, you're responding that way. Okay. (laughs) And she does the same. They just laugh at me during our meetings. I'm like, and then this happened this week. Anyways, they're like, like, me and Glenn are just like, that's unstable. Is it? No, it's not. <laughs> she's this she's is actually weird. functioning. Yeah. She's totally fine. And yeah. I think like when we had chatted about this, Raquel, of like of of wanting to move through this, we wanted to move yeah. through it in a in a little bit more of a black and white fashion as well. So yeah. not just well, like there is a huge emotional conversation that comes along with miscarriage and abortion and yeah. postpartum. There's also the slightly black and white conversation that's this is what your hormones are doing. This is how it's shifting. And so being able to have a conversation that might seem a little sterile in a way is still important within kind of the greater emotional umbrella. And I think it's so freaking important also because your hormones, and I don't know if this is just a me thing or if other people, I'm assuming other people experience it this way, but when your hormones are going nuts and you're feeling all of the emotions because they trigger Mm -hmm. all of these emotions, you can tell sometimes that that is not a natural way for you personally to respond to something. Yeah. And then it feels like someone's taking over, which feels very much like you don't have control. But I think when you know better what's going on with your body and can understand what's happening, then it gives you that information and that safe space to move through it and to say, okay, I'm going to need extra time here because this is what my hormones are doing. Not I'm just breaking PS, <laughs> right? Like I yeah. think, I think having that information is so important. So Agreed. I'm going to do the, the very official, 
um, intro to Ashley. I'm ready. But go. Yes, but definitely go go. Please listen to the actual um, the actual episode that we did before. So which is twenty seven. Dr- 27, thank you. (laughs) Dr. Ashley Margeson is a licensed and registered naturopathic doctor with a strong focus on women's health, hormonal regulation, thank you, and health optimization and burnout recovery and prevention. She has a thriving practice filled with patients who are focused on improving their quality of life. Dr. Ashley is also the host of the Superwoman Code, which is fantastic. Please go listen. So many good episodes. Um, A weekly podcast educating young professionals and busy women about how to make their health work for them, not against them. So important. She's also a full-time stepmom to her five and seven-year-old children. Oh my gosh, I didn't even know that. How did I not know that? (laughs) I'm actually quite a private person and very particularly private about my kids because I'm like, you do not get the call right now as to whether or not you want to be on social media. So I am extremely protective over Mm. over them and their names and their faces and everything because I'm like, it's not my call. It's their call. I love that you say that. I'm the same. That's so Christina's camp. Yeah, it's (laughs) we'll have we'll have a round table on on social protection. We'll do that. Yeah, we'll definitely do that at some point. Not in December, though, because that's your month off. It is, technically. technically. Yeah. Oh, man. Okay. okay. So where are we starting? So like, yeah, walk me through. <laughs> okay. So I thought a really good starting place is just what happens to the body when you get pregnant. Because mm-hmm. I think in order to know what's happening after, you need to start knowing what's happening in the beginning. So whether you have a miscarriage or abortion or you follow through with a full term pregnancy, um, something is happening in your body. So can you walk us through that, especially hormonally? What the heck is happening? I know you double your blood content. That, you do. That I learned. You do. Because oh, nice. you're literally double. growing a, a being. Um, but like not your size. Oh, no, God, <laughs> no. Exactly but you need way I more thought. blood flow. <laughs> way more day, blood like... flow. Okay. So then before we get to like what happens with pregnancy, we actually need to go like to the whole how do you ovulate conversation. Oh, yes. Because okay. that's actually the starting point of this. So in like episode 27, we went through a lot of like estrogen and progesterone and how those change. And and we didn't talk too much about kind of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone because it wasn't integral to that conversation. It yeah. is integral to this conversation. Um, so estrogen rises in the first half of your cycle. Your follicle stimulating hormone also rises at the same time. And your follicle stimulating hormone is basically how do you grow a little cyst that has an egg within it? And the strength of that egg and the strength of like the development of the cyst and and all of these other things is determined by kind of the ratio of FSH to estrogen. So we want a good amount of estrogen coming in because it means instead of growing like five semi-good cysts and eggs, we grow one really good one. Mm. Um, What's FSH, sorry? What does that stand? Follicle stimulating hormone. So literally like the growing of the follicle. Okay. Um, And so then when estrogen reaches its peak, we get to ovulation. And so there's a big testosterone surge and there's a LH surge. So your luteinizing hormone. And when that surges, that follicle breaks open and you get a corpus luteum and you get an egg. And then that egg obviously gets fertilized or not fertilized. And then it has to implant and then kind of pregnancy starts to continue. The really kind of cool part of this conversation is luteinizing hormone. And luteinizing hormone is currently my favorite hormone right now because it's very, very cool. And because (laughs) there's a pile of new research that have just come out on it. And so luteinizing hormone is like, you guys know when you you get ovulation test kits, you have to like pee on this strip. So what that strip is testing is it's testing the luteinizing hormone that's coming out in your urine. And so it gets really dark the first time you ovulate, but then if you were to continue kind of urinating on that strip, you'd actually see that you'd start to get other spikes. Mm. So the luteinizing hormone survives for 14 days and it pulses for those full 14 days. So it pulses actually technically every 90 minutes. And as you move through that luteal phase, that luteinizing hormone is just pulsing. If you get to the end of those 14 days and you haven't had a egg get fertilized and implant, then the luteinizing hormone just dies off and you get a period. Okay. Makes sense so far? Yeah. 
the thing that causes luteinizing hormone to stay present is HCG or beta HCG, which is the hormone that we test for pregnancy. So yeah. if you get pregnant, that LH starts to, it stops pulsing and it starts to continue to increase. And it's actually the density of that luteinizing hormone in your bloodstream that maintains the pregnancy for the first three months. What? Oh my God. I Say that one more time. That. So it's your luteinizing hormone. Yeah. And it's the maintenance of the luteinizing hormone that maintains the pregnancy for the first three months. Everybody thinks it's progesterone. Everybody's like progesterone has to stay high, but progesterone is controlled by your luteinizing hormone. Wow. Oh. So if you if your luteinizing hormone starts to drop, progesterone drops. If your luteinizing hormone stays relatively steady and increases a little bit, then your progesterone stays relatively steady and increases a little bit. And so when we start talking about miscarriage, what we're actually talking about is, is that luteinizing hormone dropping? Whoa. Okay. Okay. Whoa. Okay. This just opened up so many questions. So why, I mean, I guess we can't really figure out why it drops, but are there indicators on why it drops? Like does stress drop it? Do outside factors drop it? I know some of it is probably just like spontaneous combustion, but you know, like are any <laughs> spontaneous <laughs> combustion, classic, classic Raquel right there. <laughs> Oh, what happened? Oh, no. Something felt explosive. What? Well, so there's there's different reasons why people have miscarriages, right? So yeah. we know some of them and we don't know others. And yeah. so, and one of the reasons that there's a lot of very vague conversations about miscarriages and pregnancy in general is because like we don't research pregnant women that often. Like we mm -hmm. follow them, we do what we call retrospective studies or, or where we kind of go like, oh, do you remember what this happened? Let's just follow you and see what happens and do your regular blood work. Mm. But we don't like do these randomized controlled clinical trials on pregnant women because that's just not okay. Cause we don't mm -hmm. know what the outcome is. Right. And so a lot of these, like if we were really going to look at that, we'd be testing blood every single day we'd be doing it when we know that LH is pulsing we'd be doing all of this additional testing that we just we're not going to see that research because I don't think ethically or morally yeah. we can do that research mm. and so that is one of the reasons why there is a lot of we don't really know because we actually just don't really know um what we do know is that if there aren't enough chromosomes in the egg and the sperm that have met, which is basically like your DNA building blocks of mm -hmm. how you form cells, just period, just how you form cells, then you will have what we call spontaneous miscarriages. Mm. And so like Raquel's terminology is actually not far from the truth. Uh, <laughs> just spontaneously combust. <laughs> right, because it's just like that was never going to be what we call yeah. a viable pregnancy. It just right. yeah. like yeah. growth would have stopped at some point and generally that happens before the six week mark. And is there Which, a reason for that? Like for there not being enough chromosomes? Well, I think is. it's just random. Yeah, okay. like, but I also really think that random. that's a better way to say it. Like I hate the word miscarriage because it sounds like you've done something wrong. Like it does. you miscarried something. You made a mistake and therefore this is happening. Whereas I think like not viable. That's how I kept explaining it. I was like, oh, it's not viable anymore. Like this just wasn't viable. It's a collection of cells that wasn't viable. <laughs> literally, but that's like, like, how literally. <laughs> like it's kind of like like the before as much as it's like mentally really hard, like yeah. from a physiological just like full biochemistry perspective it's just it's not viable yeah. um, and that's because like something just would have stopped growing at some point yeah um where yeah. we start to see conversations and so because of that the lh starts to drop because the beta hcg starts to drop because it, the growth just stops and then you miscarry mm -hmm. um anything really kind of in and above that kind of eight to 12 week mark, we're really looking at do, are we able to maintain that LH to maintain that progesterone? Mm. And mm -hmm. that's where you start to have these conversations of like, is it stress induced? Is it environmentally induced? Is it 
car accident induced? Is it, is it, is it? And again, the answer is we're not quite sure. Oh, wow. Because what we know is we know the strength of the corpus luteum really determines that LH and that progesterone availability. So the corpus luteum is when you ovulate, you get that corpus luteum, you get that egg. It's mm -hmm. actually the strength of that corpus luteum that allows us to maintain that progesterone development that comes from that LH through the first trimester. And so when we're looking at, is it a progesterone conversation? Is it multiple miscarriages conversation? Is it like late term miscarriages within that kind of first trimester? What we're really looking at is how do we strengthen the corpus luteum so that ideally that doesn't happen again. The issue is there's no drugs that can do that. There's no what? natural supplements mm. that can, can support the strength of the corpus luteum because that comes down to how well do you sleep? What's your nutrition? What's your exercise like? What's your body's availability and kind of resource management look like? How much estrogen is surging? How much, like it's so many little factors that come into play that you can't do an X plus Y equals Z equation. It just doesn't I, exist. I think that's such a, it's such an important point because I don't know if you know this, Ashley, but I had my eggs frozen um, a few years ago. I didn't ago. know that. Now I know that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, that's awesome. So, yeah, there's like, so we have like all these different conversations surrounding the reproductive side of things. Um, but I went to uh, Dr. Ryan Funk, who is an acupuncturist at AcuBalance, and I did light therapy. And we had this conversation about, you know, preparing for three months, like yep. up to the, what I like to call the great escape or... <laughs> <laughs> I had so many puns lined up for oh it. Oh my God, this is so good. <laughs> great expectations. I was like, yes, I've got great expectations for this. Anyway, but I, I, it, it stayed with me. And then as we started this podcast, we started to realize Raquel and I were like so ambitious about what we want to do with bombshell branches that mm -hmm. we were like, we have to biohack in every single way. And we have to be starting to prepare ourselves for the months ahead of travel for the you know for our life design to occur we have to start prepping mm -hmm. so I think that's a really great point to kind of drive home as well is that 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 lattice work of of elements that you and my my older sister Raven calls it just collecting your team and having a team yep. around you a health team and a wellness team and I think like a, a reproductive wellness team is really important and a reproductive wellness team is like, I love that you're talking about teams because this is what I like. I'm like, who's on your board of governors? Like, yeah. who are you using when you need them? And how do you build that team so that you can kind of pick and choose because you've got everybody set up? Ideally, if you're going to freeze your eggs, we want you to be freezing your eggs as early as possible. So, yeah. and this is the conversation, like we're not talking about this stuff until people are in their thirties or their forties sometimes. Yes. Um, yeah. Whereas really, if we wanted to kind of set women up for the best success, we'd be getting them to freeze their eggs in their early twenties. It's just, yeah. we're not having that conversation. It's funny though, because one of the, so I did six months of research before I got my mm -hmm. eggs frozen. And one of the places that I went to was like, no, we would turn you away if you were in your twenties. What? Yep. We would turn you away. Yep. Yeah, but that doesn't. Because but that's not research based. That doesn't make it right. That yeah. means that they they want to only do this with people. Like I was the only self employed actor, like that I knew of. Obviously, sitting in the room, they were like lawyers, doctors, people who have got like five to seven year um, degrees that they're about to embark upon. Like you qualify. Essentially, like you're allowed. Yeah. Whereas for me, I'm like, hello. <laughs> you're like, I just want to like. Make sure that if I, I want that later, I can. <laughs> well, at least I have the, and not even I can. I, I'm giving myself an option, yep. not even the option. Like yep. it, should, it should be the backup, 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 backup. But it's nice that you have so, that backup. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So Raquel, sorry, I, I, no, I no, side no, 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 I love that. And actually what, what you were saying about taking care of your body and Christina, what you were saying about prepping that you did, what I thought was really interesting in, in my situation, um, when I got pregnant, it was after probably three months of like the most stressful time of my life. Like it so was so stressed, so stressful. And I felt so guilty for thinking this. But even when I got pregnant, I was really scared to be excited because I just kept having this 
gut feeling like I just literally every time I went pee I was like checking like is it still there I don't know Mm. and I just like constantly and other people were like oh that's normal like first time whatever it's normal but to me I was like I'm not that person that acts that way like I am someone that just throws caution to the wind and is like if it happens it happens like mm-hmm. I'm which not, is exactly that is not... what that was right right the, <laughs> the, fun, the conversation I had with Raquel she was like so um you know how you said yes. you want to build a better world for mothers and create a workspace <laughs> let's, space. Yeah. let's go quicker let's with start that today let's um... start today but it is but it but we think in the same conversation though that like and we talk about this like we're like obviously like the more you're aware of where your body is sitting and and what your tipping points are and everything the stronger you're building this kind of launch pad yeah but you but like the the working of that launch pad is still kind of a 50-50 chance every single month. Right. right? Okay. So we go like, okay, so I can do all of this work. And I'm like, you can do all of that work. And that's really great. But it's still 50-50 chance. Like right. the determinants don't change based off of like, well, I've had six months. So like my chances are less. No, they're not. Mm-hmm. It's they're the same. same chance every single month. When you get a period, it resets. Okay. Mm-hmm. Your and so your reset button your period is always big your reset red reset button. Liter- literally yeah. big red reset uh, yeah. um <laughs> but like people think like oh well i've done all this work so it should be easier going out not necessarily and that's mm. the hardest part of a lot of these conversations is you feel like you've done everything right and it mm-hmm. still doesn't work or mm-hmm. you feel like you've done nothing right and then it works yeah and, yeah and right? i have like, to both say- are equal yeah Raquel is very like she's very healthy she's very like that the stress yeah was exceptional um but you're also extremely good at living like a very healthy very take care of yourself you listen to your body so well um so and that's the thing the thing that I want you to be careful of is being like well could I have because I bet you that's I mean how did you feel when you when that happened were you like what could I have done like what where did you go no I think for me it was more okay so the reality is I thought I'm 31 it's gonna take me a while to get pregnant we were being a little riskier if I'm gonna be really honest like I thought that it was gonna take like six months and and I was traveling so it's not like we were together consistently it took one month which was not at all my expectations so I was really not um like I I was literally setting up all of my duckies to get in my most healthy zone out of burnout like massive burnout so I was just like starting to set the stage and then I was like whoa it's here and I think that's the thing is that's why I was so intuitively like "Mm, I don't know because I knew and I could feel that my body was not, it wasn't even just not at my best point. It was like, phew, like really like low. It was it was really running at a low point. And so I think, well, this is all me just making up stories, which is why I love that Ashley's here. So she can tell me if it's just stories in my head. But I think that the body wants to set you up for success. And if we think about it, um if you think about like nutrition if you think about exercise if you think about sleep like all of those things are telling your body things are good in the world right now things are safe to have a have a baby and i think if you're not getting those things then it's little triggers to your body saying like shit's kind of weird right now i don't know if this is the best time and i wonder if that reduces your chances because um yeah, like things are more difficult. That said, it's kind of like a lottery. So you can still, I don't know. <laughs> it is, and it's interesting because like that, like I get to have these conversations every day of people like, well, what can I do? And I'm like, well, there is like you, we work on your sleep. We work on your nutrition. We work on like your cellular health and your egg quality and all of those things. But then there's still a big part of it that's like, that's out of your control. And so, so it's like buying an extra lottery ticket each time. Health, but it doesn't ticket. necessarily mean that it increases your, increases your chances, right? Right. Yeah. Right. And so, and so, like, and this is this is where like you have 
I think we all have to recognize that there are uncontrollable factors in this conversation. And I never, I never want anybody either listening to this or sitting in my office to feel like if you have done all of the right things and you haven't gotten pregnant, that it's now your fault. Yeah. Because it's not. Mm. Um, and so, yes, obviously the more things you can do that kind of put good quality eggs into your basket, the better. But then there's still all of those uncontrollable factors, just like there's those uncontrollable factors, like the genetic conversation and the chromosomal conversation Mm. that come along with miscarriage. Mm -hmm. Some of them are controllable. A lot of them aren't. Hmm. So I I love that. I think, and it's because I think the thing that I worry about sometimes, Raquel, is that you're still talking about, well, I did, I, you know, it was a very stressful time and this happened and my body just wasn't ready. But hypothetically speaking, you could, your body could have been like super ready and it just, they just weren't enough chromosomes yeah. and it was like combustion time. Cool. It yep. was, it was just like, <laughs> because hey, you ovulated. We'll, we'll go, yeah. we'll go next time. Yeah. See you next month kind of thing. And I think I, I really like that, you know, I want to have kids at some point. I think I do. I mean, I don't know. I haven't made a choice, but I have some eggs in a basket somewhere, uh, v- very deeply frozen. Uh, and uh, the the idea is I would like to, and to all the people that I know, I'd like for us to be able to prepare for that, mm-hmm. but prepare knowing that I love that now I will know that, hey, I can't control my chromosomes right now. Like I can, I can put myself in a really great spot but I'm not going to take full accountability because I am the type of person that will, you know, Raquel is very like, let's just see. I'm like, I will find it a way. <laughs> and I'll just go into like, okay. And when I spoke to Ryan about, about this, he was like, what would you like to do? I was like, I need to give myself every single chance possible. We do everything. We do it. Like I do it strictly. I do. <laughs> I went into this whole regime. Like, what is the protocol that I need to follow for the next three months to set yeah. myself up for the best success possible? Yeah. Except for, I was like, but we don't have three months because I want to do it before I turn 35. And he was like, uh, uh, and I was like, so do the assessments. What do I have to e- extra do? <laughs> and he was like, you know, it doesn't just turn like when you turn 35. Isn't I was like, irrelevant. <laughs> But <laughs> also, I would just like to say that that thir- so that number of 35 mm-hmm. came from a gynecologist in the United States in the 1970s who said anything over 35 is a geriatric pregnancy. I would just like to point out that there is absolutely no research that backs up that number. And if somebody <laughs> has term. research that backs it up, <laughs> I would like them to send it to me well, because I have like, yes, we know that egg quality diminishes as you get hmm. older, but like that like 35 number like as a hard cut off <laughs> well i made I don't it know. a hard cut off but i did see a chart about the reduction the number of eggs reducing um over yeah, but that starts from like when we're 16 and it, just it does slowly goes the down 35 to 37 and then the 37 to 40 but was this like huge dip and so they mm-hmm. were like 35 is around the last time like that you want to be making this choice in a big way like yes that's a really big they were like you are really optimum at this point because I made the choice you know like I think it was six months seven months before where I sat my parents down and was like hey (laughs) while we were having brunch which I was like this is interesting we're having eggs (laughs) of course you were having eggs eggs, right I had to make it make sense okay but this makes up I I think this brings up a really interesting point and this is what the research also shows us is that Mm. so like my egg quality Mm-hmm. is dependent on my mom's egg quality, which is dependent on her mom's yeah. egg quality. I and had so, that too. right? Like, so like this is mitochondrial function coming through and mitochondria is passed down by your mom. Like you only get your mitochondrial genes from your mother. And that like, it, it isn't like, that's how it works. It's so crazy, uh, right? It's so like cool for your grandmother. You. So I'm like, thank my Nana, which is why everyone in the family is super feisty. It's, 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 uh, it's totally it. Listening. But like <laughs> mitochondrial function and antioxidant support is really what the research shows us is important for egg quality. And so this is where you also start to get to some of those uncontrollable factors is right. you can do all of the right stuff to make mm-hmm. those eggs as high quality as possible. But if this is something that's like your grandmother's conversation, you can't control all of that. Yeah. So you can set yourself up on the best launch pad, but like, instead of that launch pad being like this perfect little trampoline, maybe it's like kind of got a couple broken strings on it. 
Mm -hmm. Or maybe there's this like, maybe like one of the springs is about to slightly go off and, and maybe it's fine right now, but it might not be fine in six months, but we have no way of determining Mm. that. And so this is like, there's all of those uncontrollable factors. And then the egg is only 50% of the equation. Mm. Yeah. Right. Like the sperm is the other 50% of the equation and the exact same conversation also is like, it has to happen. But like we're having this conversation about miscarriage and and Raquel, but like maybe it wasn't actually the egg. Maybe it was the sperm. Yeah. I told him to stop smoking weed. But okay, so <laughs> I have <laughs> straight away. I don't have any research straight to say anything on either side of that one. <laughs> I am not entering the conversation. <laughs> just straight. Oh, oh, it's not me. Great. <laughs> but like, Thank right? You. But we just we don't we don't know. Yeah. Like we just we don't know. We know the women's body is that LH progesterone conversation. We yeah. like I have no like way of saying here's the here's the test that we run. Here's how we determine. This is what we do for for next time. If you choose to, I don't know. I don't, I don't have that option. I have another interesting, I think it's an interesting question. Um, because I had, I, I think it's called a missed miscarriage. Now it wasn't (laughs) totally missed, but essentially what that means is like you, you open the great floodgates (laughs) and not everything leaves. Yes. Yes. And in my case, I had a really, really, really stubborn, unviable Classic. collection of cells. Classic. <laughs> you, have really, you have a really good uterine lining. <sighs> Holy dying. I'm talking months. I was in and out of six specialists. Like we just, we, we couldn't get it out. It just didn't want to leave. It was like clinging there. Mm-hmm. And like literally it got to the point where I was like in my doctor's office and I was like, that little fucker is still there. And sorry for swearing, but, and then he, he like looks at me. He's like, yeah, that little fucker. And I was like, I just made my doctor swear. Oh, this is not the right now. This is hey, think about, Like think about what that does to like your hormonal cascade. Like it's just, oh, it was because awful. theoretically as you have a miscarriage, yeah. What should happen with the LH and then the progesterone is it actually should really just feel no different than coming yeah. into your per- period because that's the exact same hormonal cascade that happens, right? Yeah. Like that LH starts to drop, progesterone starts to drop, you start to bleed. Like yeah. theoretically, if you're having a miscarriage of, of a non-viable pregnancy, that like it shouldn't feel any different. Okay. Yeah. Except then it does. I... It totally does. Like Okay. I need to go back a second. Uh, yeah. So when, so without being super graphic, because I don't, I, I do want to, I don't want to, I want to keep this PG so, that's, to some extent. Um, but Raquel, what did you go through? And Ashley, what, not was what happening? is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like what was, what is happening? What could, what can happen sometimes? Like I have no concept of what the different types of miscarriage are like how you might feel at the beginning neither did i Mm -hmm. so how did you talk me through that raquel like what happened to you um Mm -hmm. in what however much you want to share um and then i'd like to hear like from ashley like what else can happen how you can feel because some people might have no idea what's happening and that's a massive fear straight away you're like oh i'm doing this and then you're like how how do i know what to feel or you know what are the things okay. yeah so i'm gonna tell you right off the bat that's exactly how i felt i felt like i didn't know what was going on i knew mm. something was amiss so the first time i was like on my way back from the ferry i had a massive bleed and i was like okay this is it like i i mourned it i was like definitely feeling it and i was like okay this is what this is there's no way that this could have survived that like there's what no is way. it cramping it's, as well like is it just like I pain I didn't I think it's supposed to be and I think maybe that's part of the problem is that I had no cramping at all you had no pain um, I didn't even know it was happening I just got up from my chair and I was like I'm still hot you know when you're sitting on a chair for a long time it's like warm well yeah. I also had like a warmer and so I was like oh 
wait, like, I'm warm a little too much. And it was just, it was blood. Mm. So I had blood out a lot, and I was like, okay, that's what it is. And I had to fly that week back to Amsterdam on my own. So I was like, okay, well, this just happened. Then I'm not going to go to a doctor here because, like, this has happened. Like, I can see that it's over, whatever. So dealt with it, went back to Europe, and then the day I arrived in Europe, I was like, oh my god, it's so embarrassing. For anyone else, I hope nobody else has ever had to go through this. Oh, but... guaranteed multiple people have gone oh, through Oh my god, I was like sitting, this is so, so embarrassing, but I was sitting at a restaurant, and I was like, oh my god, like, because I had stopped bleeding by this point. It had been, like, a week, like, I had had my blood, I'd stopped bleeding. I was still Ugh. wearing, like, period panties, because I was like, I just want to be safe. But I saturated my pants, like, full on, and then I had to quickly pay and, like, run home. Thankfully, I was just down the block, and I had, like, a, a long jacket, so I could kind of cover, but it was so embarrassing. I was like, how is this happening again? Like, this is, mm -hmm. and it wasn't, like, a little bit of blood. This was a lot. And so I was like, this now is worrying me. And I Googled, and I Googled, and I went, and I'm in university right now, so I have access to the, to the medical journals in the library, and I researched that, and I was not finding anything to help me with this like I was like okay like it could be this I guess like the fetus is probably still in there blah 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 um anyway so I finally went into a doctor and it was months I've I took the medications like it just never left uh finally the fetus did go but I would say with a situation like that what's really difficult about it is you still feel pregnant and I'd really like Ashley to talk about that because your boobs are still sore. They're massive. Like your skin is still clear. Like all of these feelings that you have that you're pregnant still remain. And it makes it a lot more, I felt for me, a lot more emotional because mm -hmm. I still felt it was, I knew it wasn't there, but I still felt like I was pregnant. And it, mm -hmm. it was just like, yeah, you like probably it really still had like some of those hormonal like beta hcg yeah. would have still i been still had there. a full like i peed on a stick and i was like more pregnant than i was before like i yep. was just carrying on like my i guess like your hormones have half-lives but for me i think it was actually still like the, the fetus was still there so yeah it was like still thought that something was happening <laughs> but it wasn't yeah and that's that like that's that beta hcg conversation again right because that maintains that lh and if beta mm. hcg drops lh is supposed to drop which then drops progesterone which then causes the the uterine lining to kind of slough off that mm. didn't happen right so for some reason you were still having some beta hcg being produced which means mm. it was really difficult to kind of fully get rid of that that uterine lining abort the right? mission abort the mission <laughs> Um, but it's interesting though, cause we start to like, like Christina just said something really interesting about like, well, was there cramping? Like there mm -hmm. should actually be cramping because mm -hmm. like if we, let's just say you went to full term and you were going to deliver. Well, just before delivery, what happens is there's, there's fetal plasma corticosteroids. So like there's your uterine lining and then there's the placenta mm -hmm. and then there's like the amniotic fluid that the fetus lives in and so we're talking in that amniotic fluid, there are like fetal, fetal plasma corticosteroids. And just before delivery, those increase. Mm -hmm. And that increase of those corticosteroids causes your placenta to stop producing as much estradiol and progesterone. And when that happens, it triggers the release of something known as prostaglandins. And prostaglandins mm -hmm. get produced every single month when you have a a period anyway and those are actually what induce the clotting and the cramping associated with it and so if you're not cramping you're not getting those prostaglandins in place which means the uterus is losing its initial lining but it's not losing the lining that is kind of into the endometrium and the myometrium area and so then you start to because there's still now a little bit of beta hcg and lh you start to build another lining on top of that and then that releases and then you're starting to build a lining and that releases and so it's this it's almost like this this dance in a way of all of these hormones and they have to get into the right rhythm together for everything to work and 
we don't know why sometimes it doesn't kind of completely all connect, but it would have probably been not having the prostaglandins, Mm -hmm. which means that maybe you have a little bit more estrogen building up than somebody else does. Maybe your progesterone receptors are highly sensitive. And so like that would have developed through kind of that, that strength and that stubbornness in your uterine lining. (laughs) It's, it's all of these conversations. And then like the mifeprestone, which is the the drug that's used here in Canada, at least. Same it's drug, pre- did nothing drug. for me. It's a progesterone antagonist. Oh. So it just binds to a progesterone receptor. So then you stop, like your own progesterone can't bind to it. And so then kind of the uterine lining disengages. Well, if it's not a progesterone issue, that drug does nothing. Oh. So it wasn't, a, it wasn't a progesterone issue. <laughs> Right. So all of these, like, so what we do is we mathematically kind of go through and we're like, okay, so this is the one that we're going to start with. That doesn't do anything. So it's not a progesterone conversation. What's the next step? What's the next step? What's the next step? And usually there's ultrasounds in between. Yeah. Um, And a ton. ton. Checking out and see where things are at, what's working, what's not. And ultimately what generally happens is we need a DNC, which Mm -hmm. is kind of like a, like a functional conversation i guess is the easiest it way to put it sucks it out like a vacuum <laughs> actually but... that's how i describe my my great escape tiny little <laughs> vacuum <laughs> and they just go i like yeah. yours more than what i was imagining because mine was more like a... <laughs> a little bit of a larger scale Right. But then it also depends, like, then it also depends, like, where did that egg Mm. implant, right? Like if Mm. it it implanted in like one of the sides of the uterus, well, generally that's a lot easier. If it implanted at the top of the uterus, that's a lot harder. What if it implanted in like close to the fallopian tube? Well, that's really difficult to disengage Mm. because you're not technically in the uterine lining, which is where we get to conversations about like atopic pregnancies. Yeah. What, Um, tell me, I was just going to ask about, there's ectopic and atopic pregnancies? Ectopic. Ectopic same thing okay ect okay and that's what is that it's when the egg implants not in the uterus okay okay so and is it possible to still do a full-term pregnancy or what do they know i mean theoretically it is but that would be at like like the chances of mom surviving oh very 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 low and so with an atopic pregnancy it's a surgical like you need to go into surgery to have Mm. that removed but then you have the full because you've now surgically removed kind of the the building phase then all of a sudden your progesterone and lh are dropping right at the same time when they should be dropping offset each other and so you really feel that loss in hormones Hmm. atopic Hmm pregnancies tend to have a harder hormone like emotional outset um because of that yeah because you're not seeing an end and because you well because the horn it's like everything and then nothing as opposed to a non-viable pregnancy it starts to slowly decrease and so then you get that like natural like okay natural like as in like it's very close to what you feel pre-period as opposed to an ectopic pregnancy it's like it's like a line so is that the same then as if you were to have an abortion then like a chosen abortion rather than a spontaneous abortion which is another term for a miscarriage but where it's Ish. removed suddenly with the hormones but the abortion suddenly? pills mm-hmm. only bind to their their progesterone antagonists oh so it's the same as the as the miscarriage it's closer pills. to the miscarriage than a surgical okay. Yeah, okay. because you're you're basically binding to a receptor that something else can't bind to. And then because it can't bind, then it actually does start to mimic a non-viable pregnancy miscarriage. Mm. It's just, it's fast or it's supposed to be fast. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So it, the intensity can be a lot more. So I want to ask a question about um, the who you need to go and see, right? Like, and obviously it's very different for different people. And Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to kind of get to know who you are and how you process emotion um, at the big, like right at the outset of, uh, I mean, life. But if you are, once this has happened in whatever your way is, 
what do you do if if you're feeling this are you like okay do i call the ambulance do i call a doctor like what 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 is your actual process of like immediate triage and then afterwards how do you kind of set yourself up or what are some of the things that i could think about in my own case that i need to kind of checklist and be like is this really my emotion or is this hormones draining like mm -hmm. what are some of those things like walk me through and you can't be every case but like some big overarching things like i would just be like call an ambulance i don't know what's happening <laughs> yeah so i mean generally i recommend like if if a patient of mine is having a miscarriage it's er okay and so like oh, you're triaged really? into the er yeah because we need an ultrasound like we really do actually because of this exact conversation that raquel mm. just had i need to know that if you are having a miscarriage then i need to know that it like you're having a full miscarriage and that's what the ultrasound will tell us. And so then we check your beta HCG over a week. So you should have generally either once a week or a couple times a week, you have a blood test to just determine that that beta HCG is dropping. And once the beta HCG is down to like zero or under one, then we know that everything is kind of completely miscarried. Ultrasound looks good. Uterine lining is fine, which most cases it is. Um, but those are big, are big checks is, is your beta HCG back down below one? And does the ultrasound show that there's no retained um, fetal parts? And what are some of the symptoms that can happen while that's straining? Is it like you can, you or like reducing? Uh, is it, you know, you, you, you can get hot flashes? Like what are some of the things that can happen as this process is going on? It depends on how thick the uterine lining is. Like okay. it depends on the strength of that placenta. And this is why it's so determinant on each person mm. because estrogen and progesterone are controlled and controlling the endometrium to placenta conversation. And so if you're somebody who builds a very strong uterine lining every single month, you might feel kind of hot flashes. You might feel mm. like fatigue. You might feel some brain fog associated with it because you're losing estrogen at a much faster rate. If okay. you're somebody whose receptors are highly sensitive to hormonal fluctuations, which is a huge conversation. This is where a lot of the research in, in kind of hormones is going right now is receptor status. Okay. So some people's receptors are more sensitive than others. We see that in women who get really emotional PMS. We see that with PMDD. We see that with postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety is it's not the hormone. It's how your system responds to the change in hormones. And this is right. why it's so like individual mm -hmm. because like you can't control your receptor status. You could have like, we could do blood work and you could have your estradiol at like 650. I could have my estradiol at 650 and Raquel could have her estradiol at 650, but we could all feel that differently mm. because of how we break down that hormone, how our serotonin responds to estrogen, because those are connected, how our dopamine responds to that shift in estrogen. Like it is so, it's not a number on a page. It's a mm. receptor status conversation. Right. I love that, that we're finally moving. Yeah, totally. I love that we're finally moving into that realm as well. And like looking, finally going back to in Western medicine is more people are looking at the holistic side of health and the receptor is like, okay, let's, let's acknowledge as human beings that we don't actually have any control over anything as much as we <laughs> thought we did. Kind of what the receptors do, right? Like it's, it's beta endorphins, it's cortisol, it's testosterone. Like mm. it is, it is so different for each person. Right. And it, and it is just the knowledge of it is okay that it's different. Yeah. It is okay that it takes some people three months to process those, those changes and to feel like yourself again, because that's a full cell turnover. So mm. if you're highly receptive to hormonal changes, I would expect you probably don't feel like yourself for about three months after a miscarriage. And then knowing that you can manage expectations you yeah. can, with yourself yes. and with other people. Yeah. Physiologically, you may be perfectly fine. You might check every single box on on the book, but if mm -hmm. we know that you're you're sensitive to the, those hormonal shifts, you're mm. probably not going to feel like yourself and come out of that fog for a couple of months. Now, maybe you're somebody who like barely feels those hormonal shifts. You're, like you ovulate the next month, you could technically get pregnant the next month. 
Right. There is no reason as to why you could not get pregnant the next month after a miscarriage. You don't have to wait for anything. Physiologically, you can kind of like do whatever you want. A lot of people will not even realize, realize that they've miscarried um, because they just get a period at the time then they would naturally get a period or maybe it's two or three days late, but it's actually a miscarriage, mm. right? Like it, it, for some people, it's really not a big deal. And for some people, it lingers and both are valid and both are true. So question on that, because I noticed that I was pregnant really quickly because my body reacted really quickly and immediately, like there were so many changes. And literally my friend who's a doctor was like, he called me out on it. He was like, you're pregnant. And I was like, what? Like, how could you know that? He's like, no, I can see it. It's in your face, this, that. I was like, holy. So would that be happening because I'm sensitive then? Is that something you would expect if someone was sensitive? I would expect, okay. and your prostaglandins may be a little bit higher on a natural, like just the, like the naturally circulating level may just be a little bit higher, but yeah, like mm. some people we can tell right away and some people know right away. Like I have patients that like, I know they've ovulated the week before and I see them and I'm like, your breasts are like two times the size of what they normally are. Your skin's really healthy. Like, <laughs> like you're probably pregnant right now because you like for some people you can. And for some mm-hmm. people, like they may not know until like three some people months. give birth and they don't some know. people like <laughs> give birth at five months and have no idea to which i'm like really like it was okay that you didn't have a period for five months but that's a whole other conversation I um i mean that's a whole other conversation but receptor wise like you may feel no different and hmm. that's okay oh uh, okay okay so That actually leads really nicely into my next question, which is how the heck do you normalize after? So whether you've had an abortion, whether you've had a miscarriage or whether you've gone to full term, I don't know if there's massive difference in the aftermath because I've never gone to full term, but I do know from friends that I've talked to that everyone talks about how pregnancy ends at the nine month mark, or they think, you know, you have have a miscarriage or you have an abortion, it ends there. Mm -hmm. But there's this like, onslaught of hormonal changes like I'm not kidding you I had acne everywhere I was like I didn't even have acne as a teenager like what's happening to me um so how do you regulate and you can feel like your emotions and everything so how do you kind of like what are your tips on regulating that again I mean it still comes down to receptor status and I'm gonna like I'm gonna come back down to this one again (laughs) because so you can you could track LH right? After a miscarriage, after an abortion, it really comes down to when do you ovulate next? Mm -hmm. Because technically, as soon as you ovulate next, you're back into your rhythm. It's just Mm -hmm. a question of how long does it take you to get your next ovulation cue. And that's an area that we don't really have, like, it's not easy to say like, oh, we just do this because like, it's so different, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you are a shift worker versus not a shift worker, if you travel a lot, if you don't travel a lot, if you, you know, have a high stress job versus don't have a high stress job, like all of those things determine into this Mm -hmm. and the health of your uterus determines right like i Mm -hmm. like miscarriages and abortions can be silver linings in a way because they they physically cause a reset to Mm -hmm. the like it's like that big red button reset button times four yeah right and so like those that can be a silver lining for some people because maybe your uterine lining was really inflamed before and it was building on top of it. And now this has actually reset things. So we're actually giving you a better launch pad for the next time you get pregnant, right? Like Mm. that's a possibility. It comes down to, it comes down to how do you feel? Mm. So if you're still getting all of these hormonal shifts afterwards, well, you're probably really sensitive to the hormonal changes. And so then it comes down to like, you need to just give your body the capacity to build those hormones really well which is protein and fat, right? Like like it's nutrition. (laughs) It's going like, I need to eat foods that are really easy to digest. I need to eat Mm -hmm. foods that are really warm. I need to eat foods that are, are low inflammatory, but that's, that's something that I would get somebody to do if they had had surgery, right? Mm -hmm. Because your system just went through a big traumatic experience. The, outcome of that is still like we need to rebuild you but we need to do it in a way where you don't have to expend a lot of energy to do so and then there's the emotional side of it 
right? So if you're really feeling those emotional ups and downs and you feel like it's really unstable, well, it's probably your serotonin and dopamine readjusting to that big drop in estrogen and now trying to rebuild it. And then the big drop that comes with the next period out. And so that comes down to how do you, how do you build more so that your receptors are a little bit more stable? How do you build more? <laughs> Good nutrition and time. Right. Like, and this yeah. is the other big thing is like, once that's happened, it's our three month mark to like, this is why we say like, you really do have to be kind to yourself for three months because mm -hmm. you can't change cell turnover. Like you can't speed up cell turnover. You can't like, we can adjust things. We can make sure that you're sleeping so that, you know, you replenish stuff faster, that you turn stuff over faster, but like, you can't change that three month cell turnover. Mm. One more question for you that I keep thinking I should ask because we've talked about how um, if you're having a miscarriage you should go to the hospital and mm -hmm. make sure that everything has come out the way it should yep. why do we need to do that what is what is the problem if it doesn't all come out infection okay like if it doesn't actually all come out like there can be hemorrhaging which is a massive blood loss there can be infection mm -hmm. from retained kind of placentas and um, those are the two big ones and those are the things that because of, of modern medicine in the way that it is, could you theoretically be fine? Absolutely. If you don't have access to an ER and you stop bleeding after a couple of days and you feel like yourself, am I really worried? No, but we have access to modern healthcare. So let's use it to make sure, double check all of those things are doing what they should be doing. I love that. So don't be like me wait over a week and then fly across the world <laughs> before you, and then wait for something else to happen before you see a doctor go to the ER. <laughs> and, it, and it may be that we just needed a, if we had, if we had gotten you in maybe a little bit faster, we yeah. could have been like, okay, we probably need the mesoprostol to just like help yeah. this finish yeah. as opposed to that lingering, we don't quite know. But then again, you Google and nobody tells you actually what right? you should do, right? Which is yeah. frustrating. It's frustrating. And also, you know, I mean, please, I hope nobody feels the way I did, but I felt like I didn't want to let my doctor down because my doctor was so excited that I got pregnant. And then I was like, I don't want to tell him that I miscarried because he's going to be so sad. And so I think there's this big like pressure on people to, especially women. And I don't know if it's worse because of the hormones at the time or what, but um, there's a lot of pressure to take care of others in front of yourself. And, um, I think one big thing that I've learned throughout this journey has been that you really do need to put yourself first in these situations and that, you know, everyone is there to support you. Mm -hmm. So your doctor's not going to be disappointed. They're going to feel for you. <laughs> I mean, like I, like I, I have been on the receive, like I have been one of the only people who have known there's a positive pregnancy and then a miscarriage. Yeah. And like, as a medical practitioner to hold that is a very, it's a very odd place to be, I think for all of us in that profession, because you are right there, but you're not feeling any of it. And it's, it's really hard to know what goes along with that, to also know that you, you can't hold that. You can't, mm -hmm. you can't make it better. Um, but I think the more we talk about miscarriage and I think the more that people realize how common miscarriages yes. actually are, I think that takes away a lot of the guilt of like, oh, I let, I let it down. Well, no, you didn't let anything mm -hmm. down. That just happens. Yeah. Right? And, it's like saying like, yeah. oh, I'm so sad I was born with blonde hair as opposed to brown hair. I'm so sorry to that. disappoint you. <laughs> right? Like, obviously, it's maybe not quite the same. But yeah. but like, we can't, like, we don't get to hold that, that guilt as women for yeah. something that really is uncontrollable. I love that. And I have to just give props to my partner because one of the things he told me because of course you have moments like I know logically all of the things but but I had that moment and I was like oh like I, what if there's something wrong with me and he was like Raquel there was something wrong on a cellular level and your body was smart enough to pick that up 
and it did what it was supposed to do. Struggled mm-hmm. a little at the end, but it did what it was supposed to do. And so um, he's like, no, your body is is healthy and it's functioning the way it should. And I think for me in that moment, that was like everything I needed to hear. And I just hope anyone at home who may have gone through this or hopefully not but if you ever go through it in the future and one in four pregnancies do end in it so you know it's likely many people will I think it's really important to remember that there's not something wrong with you necessarily at all like and and even if there are things that you can improve that still doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you and Mm -hmm. your body is doing its job the way that it should so I think that's really important yeah, I think there's so many outside factors um, always with everything we do um, and just yeah. knowledge. I couldn't agree more about have, being able to normalize the conversation and being able to normalize that everyone has a like different reaction to it. You know, finding mm-hmm. your health team, finding support groups that are good for you. And I think Raquel, you do this really well where you're like, I'm putting myself first and I'm telling only the people that I know are not going to like you and I have had this conversation so Mm -hmm. much where I don't play I don't do the oh no oh no well is you me yes card like oh no I hate sympathy I'm like stop it (laughs) yeah well it's hard though because it's like somebody tries to take your pain you're like you can't take that yeah, yeah, don't like no. like because now I have to deal with your pain about my pain yes. on top of my pain. Yeah, yeah. We've or the this worst is so also when people like avoid it. Like they're like, "Oh, I'm so sorry," and then they like can't look at you. Like it's a it's gonna <laughs> so affect sorry. them now. Like your bad luck is just gonna like waft onto them. I'm like, oh, okay, okay. But I think that's <laughs> a, this is where I think, and this is where I love this podcast so much and the show that we're doing is that you know so many things point to the same things build a team of, of fire friends, build a team of yeah. amazing emotional, mental, and uh, physical health professionals and holistic people around you, uh, you know, and learn how to communicate by trying, <laughs> just trying different yeah. ways. And Nobody everything. knows how to communicate until you try. Like you just yeah. have to like go out there and be like, okay, oh, hey, this is, this is where I'm at. This is how I'm feeling. Yeah. And this is the thing for like everybody listening in to be like, like if you're you know, in Raquel's position where you're like, I still feel like I'm not quite where I need to be. Great. Mm. You need to tell your team that. Yeah. Yeah. Like you literally be like, I am two months out from this marriage carriage and I am still not feeling like myself. Like, what do we need to do? Yeah. Yeah. And I think a big piece of that is knowing like Raquel, you're really good at this is knowing when it's, even though, yes, you've just said like, I have my moments of, of taking that on a little, the taking responsibility or false responsibility, um, Mm -hmm. is a better way of putting that. I think, um, you still will say, you'll still be like, I'm putting my hand up. This is happening right now. I don't know the answer. I'm not sure what's going to happen. And that allows for people to, to rally beside you and give you what you need, or at least Mm -hmm. what you think you need. And then allow you to be like, no, that wasn't right. (laughs) I don't like that. (laughs) Something else. Let's try something else. Next, next option. Yeah, Yeah. but let's try. And I think that's the big thing about Raquel and I talk a lot now about iteration and about this, this whole show being about being brave, living full and continuing to -hmm. challenge the status quo because the status quo is not uh, is not helpful for everyone. The status quo is helpful for the status. Well, the status quo is helpful for the person who has determined what the status quo is. Yes, exactly. Right. Yes. So I love, I love status quo. Give me my status quo every single day. But like <laughs> my status quo is very different from yours. Is very mm-hmm. different from Raquel's. Like it's, mm-hmm. it's very different from my partners, from my kids. Like all of our status quos should be determinant on like where we're at in our hormonal cycle. What's going yeah. on? What does our system like? Right. Like your status quo has to change. Yeah. Yeah. And we need to yeah. keep. We need to build enough space. I think it's important to build enough space to know. And when you know at least some questions to ask and you're, you can have a conversation that it just makes life so much uh, easier to navigate as you iterate through conversation and, for, and through communication. Yeah, for sure. And have the conversations. I think it's so important. Like the, the uncomfortable ones, it's like, is exactly what you guys said. I felt so robotic talking about it at first because yeah, it was a weird thing to talk about. I'd never gone through it, but I started just trying to normalize it. Like literally I'd be going for a facial and I was like, oh, my my hormones are out of whack. And they'd be like, why? And I was like, I'm not gonna lie. Like I missed it. Why would you lie? That's why. (laughs) Yeah. 
<laughs> right? Yeah. But I think everyone's reaction is like so shocked. But I think it's so important because you you want to have good information out there and you also want to have anecdotal stories from those people around you who've experienced the th- same thing. And after this, I found that a lot of people in my circle had experienced this and I had no clue. So mm. had I known that before, that would have been, you know, really helpful. And I'm hoping that um, us talking about it um, will also pave the way for more conversations about it. Yeah, so. good job. Good job. Meanwhile, Thank I you. it would probably not happen for me. I would probably just very quietly disappear into and social media would just be a bunch of gifts for a while. Uh, and, and then, then I would back and then I come back and, and, you know, and some people don't want to talk about it with others. And they don't, you know, I, I think whatever you choose to do with it, process the way that is healthy for you to process process with your team, like really challenge. Is this what I am I trying? Am I, you know, throwing this out into the world because I need help again? This is the share from the scar. And with Raquel, I'm very happy that we get to do this because we both do it when we're ready. Like it was years after my egg freezing that I mm-hmm. was ready to speak about it. It's been, you know, enough time for you as well. Like we've both we determined, waited months. we checked yeah, it. We, waited we checked. Yeah. yeah, we checked. So check in on yourself and, and, uh, and, and if you've gone through anything like this, you know, please get in touch with your healthcare team, whoever it is that you've assembled around you. Um, we've put a whole bunch of resources that we have. Um, you can connect with other people who know a lot more about Find this. Find an Ashley. Find an Ashley. <laughs> Find yourself an Ashley. You um, just need to be available everywhere, Ashley. Like if that, if you can make that yeah, happen. Yeah, can you just be omnipresent? <laughs> like, can I just be what? like this all encompassing being? Yeah. Yes. Yes, like, that's please. a lot of pressure. That's um, a lot of is pressure. it though? <laughs> is it? It's just a natural extension. It's you iterating. <laughs> so it will be like Ashley Margeson, the Oracle. The oh, God. <laughs> oh, dear Lord. I don't know how I feel about this. I'm like blushing over here. Uh, our next episode will be like Ashley Margeson became the Oracle. Great. Yeah. Eternals. I'll just go full on Marvel Universe. That's it's what I'm going to do. Marvel Universe. That's it. Yeah. yeah. I love it. The hormone yeah. superhuman lady. <laughs> fine like but I'm really just thinking about this like like I I feel like we have such a a state of privilege to be able to talk about this and because our moms never had this chance yeah our grandmothers never had this chance like I think that this is this is our role and I always think of I always think about it at least is like how can I what can I do now that makes it better for the next generation of women yeah right like I I feel like my grandmother's generation of women were really fighting for that like right to be involved and right to vote and right to have access to kind of you know right to be alive right to be alive granted for at this time my mom's generation was the generation that kind of mobilized women into the workforce Mm. I think our generation is understanding like where do I put my time Mm. right like how do I Mm. determine what I want. I now get the chance to say, I can choose if I want to freeze my eggs. I can choose if I want to have kids. I can choose if I want to adopt. I can choose if I want a career. I can choose if I want a percentage of all of that. I get that choice. Mm -hmm. And I think our job is, as this generation is going, like we're transcending the actually getting to make that choice, which means that's easier for the next generation of women. Yeah. Agreed. And so like, it's just, it's this big overarching picture of like, I think every generation has something that we teach to the next generation and moves that ball forward. Mm-hmm. Um, and hopefully for, you know, our other gender as well. Mm-hmm. Yes. For all the genders and all the, all the walks and however people are moving through their, their humanity, right? Exactly. It's, it's, I think a massive part of it is having is starting the conversation and being able to recognize when you're ready to share from the scar and not from the wound. Um, And when you're ready to do so, to do so with kindness and with the understanding that every single person is different and Mm -hmm. together you're making a, you know, you're moving things a little bit forward in whatever way is organically human. Leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here, for having this really, really tough conversation for a lot of people um and uh, Raquel you did an amazing job good job being vulnerable yes good job lady <laughs> you did um, well 
Proud, and proud of you. <laughs> just vulnerable, sensitive Raquel over here. She's like, uh, I'm just gonna feel this all like like a foot away from myself. <laughs> last week, last week Raquel was like, something happened. I was like, oh, were your eyes leaking again? Is that what that was? And she was like, no, I know what that is now. It's like, oh. yeah. um, but conversations like this, like it's so it, it's so magical to be able to have this conversation in both a this is a personal conversation. Mm-hmm. It's a professional conversation. It's an emotional conversation, but it also is a bit of a black and white conversation. And yeah. to be yes. able to lace that all in together has mm-hmm. been like, I don't get the chance to do that a lot. So thanks for giving uh, me the space. Oh, yes. we're so happy. We're so happy. Thank uh, you. Yeah, you're amazing. Thanks for listening, Bombshells. In order to continue to elevate, subscribe and don't forget to click that little bell so you can get notified every time we have a new badass brunch. Until next time, stay focused, fierce and fabulous.